Hey, it's Brett, and you're watching Brett and Some Books. Today we are continuing uh, Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail 72 by Hunter S. Thompson. And this is Chapter 2, January. The Million Pound Shithammer. Pros scorn the youth vote. Fresh meat for the boys in the back room. The death of hope and a withering expectation. Another McCarthy crusade. John Lindsay. The rancid resurrection of Hubert Humphrey. Violence in the press box and mano a mano on TWA. Why, who is Big Ed and why is everybody sucking up to him? Quote, there are issues enough. What is gone is the popular passion for them. Possibly hope is gone. The failure of hope would be a terrible event. The blacks have never been cynical about America. But conversation you hear among the young now, on the south side of Chicago, up in Harlem, or in Bedford Stuyvesant, certainly suggests the birth of a new cynicism. In the light of what government is doing, you might well expect young blacks to lose hope in the power elites. But this is something different. A cold, personal indifference. A separation of man from man. What you hear and see is not rage, but injury, a withering of expectations. D.J.R. Brucknett, January 6, 1972, in the L.A. Times. Bruckner's article focused on the mood of young blacks, but unless you were reading very closely, the distinction was easy to miss. Because the mood among the young whites is not, so, is not much different, despite a lot of well-financed publicity about the potentially massive youth vote. These are the 25 million or so new voters between 18 and 25, going maybe to the polls for the first time, who supposedly told the fright of the nation in the palms of their eager young hands. According to the people who claim to speak for it, this youth vote has the power to zap Nixon out of office with a flick of its wrist. Hubert Humphrey lost in 68 by 499,704 votes, a minuscule percentage of what they called the youth vote could turn out in 72. But there are not many people in Washington who take this notion of the youth vote very seriously, not even the candidates. The thick the thinking here is that the young people who vote for the first time in 72 will split more or less along the same old lines as their parents and that the addition of 25 million new potential voters means just another sudden mass that will have to be absorbed into the same old patterns. Just another big wave of new immigrants who don't know the score yet, but who will learn it soon enough, so why worry? Why indeed? The scumbags behind this thinking are probably right, once again. But it might be worth pondering, this time, if perhaps they might be right for the wrong reasons. Almost all the politicians and press wizards who denigrate the so-called youth vote as a factor in the 72 elections have justified their thinking with a sort of melancholy judgment on the kids themselves. How many will even register, they ask, and even then... Even assuming a third of the possibles might register, how many of those will actually get out and vote? The implication, every time, is that the youth vote menace is just a noisy paper tiger. Sure, some of these kids will vote, they say, but the way things look now, it won't be more than 10%. That's the colleges. The other 90% are either military types, on the dole, or working people, on salary, just married, hired into their first jobs. Man, these people are already locked down, the same as their parents. That's the argument, and it's probably safe to say right now that there is not a single presidential candidate, media guru, or backstairs politics wizard in Washington who honestly believes the youth vote will have any more than a marginal splinter vote effect on the final outcome of the 72 presidential campaign. These kids are turned off from politics, they say, most of them don't even want to hear about it. All they want to do these days is lie around on waterbeds and smoke that goddamn marijuana. Yeah, and just between you and me, Fred, I think it's time for all... I think that's probably all for the best. 
according to a half dozen high powered organizations in Washington who claim to speak for the youth vote, only one with any real muscle at its point is the National Association of Student Governments, which recently, after putting together an emergency conference for new voters in Chicago last month, brought its leadership back to D.C. and called the press conference in the old Senate office to announce the formation of the National Youth Caucus. The idea, said 26-year-old Dwayne Draper, the man who was the main organizer, was to get student-type activists into power on the local level in every state where they might be able to influence the drift of the 72 election. The press conference was well attended, Edward F. Morgan of PBS was there, dressed in a snappy London fog raincoat and twirling a black umbrella. The New York Times sent a woman, the Washington Post was represented by a human pencil, and the rest of the national press sent some people they send to everything that happens, officially, in this doomed sinkhole of a city. As always, the print people stood or sat in a timid half-circle behind the network TV cameras, while Draper and his mentor, Senator Fred Harris of Oklahoma, sat together at the front table and explained the success of the Chicago rally had gotten that youth vote off to a running start. Harris didn't say much. He just sat there looking like Johnny Cash while Draper, a former student body president at the University of Oklahoma, explained to, explained to the jaded press that the youth vote would have an important and perhaps decisive factor in this year's election. I came in about ten minutes late. When the question time came round, I asked the same one I'd asked Ellard Lowenstein at a similar press conference in Chicago. Would the Youth Caucus support Hubert Humphrey if he won the Democratic nomination? Lowenstein had refused to answer the question in Chicago, saying, We'll cross that bridge if we come to it. But in Washington, Draper said yes, the youth vote should get behind Hubert He's, if he said the right things, if he takes the right positions. How about Jackson? I asked. This made for a pause, but eventually Draper said the National Youth Caucus might support Jackson too, if he comes around. Around to what? I asked. And by this time I was feeling very naked and conspicuous. My garb and general demeanor were not considered normal by Washington standards. Levi's don't make it in this town. If you show up wearing Levi's, they figure you're in a servant or a messenger. This is particularly true at a high-level press conference where any deviation from the standard journalistic dress is considered rude and perhaps even dangerous. In Washington, all journalists dress like bank tellers, and those who don't have problems. Mr. Nixon's press handlers, for instance, have made it ominously clear that I shall not be given White House press credentials. For the first time I called, they said they'd never heard of Rolling Stone. Rolling what? said the woman. You better ask somebody a little younger, I said. Thank you, she hissed. I'll do that. But the next obstacle up the line was the deputy White House press secretary, a faceless voice called Gerald Warden, who said the rolling whatever didn't need White House press credentials, despite the fact they had been issued in the past without any hassle to all manner of strange and obscure publications, including student newspapers like the George Washington University Hatchet. The only people who seem genuinely interested in the 72 elections are the actual participants, the various candidates, their paid staff people, Thousands of journalists, cameramen, and other media-connected hustlers who will spend most of this year humping their campaign along. And, of course, all the sponsors, called fat cats in the language of now politics, who stand to gain hugely for the at least the next four years, they can muscle their man down the home stretch just a hair ahead of the others. The fat cat action is still one of the most dramatic aspects of presidential campaigning, but even this colorful area of tensions is leaking away, primarily because most of their really serious fat cats figured out a few years back that they could bear beat the whole rap, 
along with the onus of going down the tube with some desperate loser by helping two candidates instead of just one. A good example of this in 1972 will probably be Mrs. Relefactor, ex-wife of Jake the Barber and the largest single contributor to Hubert Humphrey's campaign in 68. She didn't get a hell of a lot of return for the, her investment this time around, last time around, but this year, using the new method, she can buy total friendship of two, three, or perhaps even four presidential candidates for the same price by splitting up the nut as discreetly as possible between Hubert, Nixon, and maybe just for the neutral Randy hell of it, a chunk to Gene McCarthy, who appears to be cranking up a genuinely weird campaign this time. I have a particular affection for McCarthy, nothing serious or personal, but I recall standing next to him in the snow outside the exit door of a shoe factory in Manchester, New Hampshire, in February of 68, when the five o'clock whistle blew and he had to stand there in the midst of those workers rushing out to the parking lot. I'll never forget the pain in McCarthy's face as he stood there with his hand out, saying over and over again, Shake hands with Senator McCarthy. Shake hands with Senator McCarthy. Shake hands with Senator McCarthy. A tense plastic smile on his face, snapping nervously toward anything friendly. Shake hands with Senator McCarthy. But none of the crowd, the crowd, most of the crowd ignored him, refusing to even acknowledge his outstretched hand, staring straight ahead as they hurried out to their cars. This was not the least... There was at least one TV network camera on him, on hand that afternoon, but the scene never aired. It was painful enough just being there, but to have, but to have put that scene on national TV would have been an act of genuine cruelty. McCarthy was obviously suffering, not so much because nine out of ten people refused to shake his hand, but because he really hated being there in the first place but his managers had told him it was necessary, and maybe it was. Later, when his outlandish success in the New Hampshire shocked Johnson into retirement, I half expected McCarthy to quit the race himself rather than suffer all the way to Chicago, like Castro in Cuba, after Batista fled. And only God knows what kind of vengeful energy is driving him this time, but a lot of people who said he was suffering from brain bubbles when he first mentioned that he might run again in 72 or beginning to take him seriously, not as a Democratic contender, but as an increasingly possible fourth party candidate with the power to put a candidate like Muskie through terrible changes between August and November. And here is a picture of Eugene McCarthy. So you can see that. Democratic Chairman Larry O'Brien, that specter of McCarthy candidacy in 72 must be something like hearing the hound of the Baskervilles sniffing and pissing around on your porch every night. A left-bent fourth-party candidate with a few serious grudges on his mind could easily take enough left radical votes away from either Muskie or Humphrey to make Democratic nomination all but worthless to either one of them. Nobody seems to know what McCarthy has in mind this year, but the possibilities are ominous, and anybody who thought he was kidding got snapped around fast last week when McCarthy launched a brutish attack on Muskie within hours after the Maine senator made his candidacy official. The front page of the Washington Post carried photos of both men, along with the prominent headline in McCarthy's harsh warning that was going to hold Muskie accountable for his hawkish stance on the war in Vietnam prior to 68. McCarthy also accused Muskie of the most active representative being the most active representative of Johnson administration policy at the 68 convention. Muskie seemed genuinely shaken by this attack. He immediately called the press conference to admit he'd been wrong about Vietnam in the past, but that now I've had reason to change my mind. His new position was an awkward thing to explain, but after admitting his past mistakes, he said that he now favored as close to an immediate withdrawal from Vietnam as possible. McCarthy merely shrugged. He had done his gig for the day, and Muskie was jolted. The senator focused all his efforts on the question of the altered Vietnam stance, 
but he was ultimately probably far more disturbed by McCarthy's ugly scent revenge tainted reference to Muskie's role in the 68 Democratic Convention. This was obviously the main bone in McCarthy's throat, but Muskie ignored it, and nobody asked Gene what he really meant by the charge. Probably because there is no way to understand what happened to McCarthy in Chicago unless you were there and you saw it yourself. I've never read anything that comes anywhere close to explaining the shock and intensity I felt at that convention. And although I was right in the middle of it the whole time, I had never been able to write about it myself. For two weeks afterwards, back in Colorado, I couldn't even talk about it without starting to cry. For reasons I think I finally understand now, but I still can't explain. Because of this, because I went there as a journalist, so no emotional attachment of any kind to candidates, and only the barest of illusions about the outcome, I was not personally involved in the thing, and there is no point in presuming to understand what kind of hellish effect Chicago must have had on Gene McCarthy. I remember seeing him cross Michigan Avenue on Thursday night, several hours after Humphrey had made his acceptance speech out at the stockyards, and then wandering into the crowd at Grant Park like a defeated general trying to mingle with his troops just after the surrender. But McCarthy couldn't mingle. He could barely talk. He acted like a man in deep shock. There was not much to say. The campaign was over. McCarthy's gig was finished. He had knocked off the president and then strung himself out on a fantastic six-month campaign that had seen the murder of Martin Luther King, the murder of Bob Bobby Kennedy, and finally a bloody assault on his old campaign workers by Mayor Daly's friendly, uh, police, who burst into McCarthy's private convention headquarters at the Chicago Hilton and began breaking heads. At dawn on the Friday morning, his campaign manager, a seasoned old pro named Blair Clark, was still pacing up and down Michigan Avenue in front of the Hilton in a state so close to hysteria, hysteria that his friends were afraid to talk to him because every time he tried to say something, his eyes would fill with tears and he would have to start pacing again. Perhaps McCarthy has placed that whole scene in proper historical and poetic perspective, but if he hasn't, I'd, but if he has, I didn't read it. Or maybe he's been hanging on to the manuscript until he can find the right ending. McCarthy has a sharp sense of drama along with his kinky instinct for timing, but nobody appears to have noticed until now that he might also have a bull-sized taste for revenge. Maybe not. In terms of classic journalism, this kind of wandering, unfounded speculation will have a nasty effect on that asshole from Ireland who sent word across the waters to nail me for bad language and a lack of objectivity. There have been numerous complaints, in fact, about the publisher allowing me to get away with calling our new Supreme Court Justice William Winecrest a swine. Well, shit, what can I say? Objective journalism is a hard thing to come by these days. We all yearn for it, but who can point the way? The only man who comes to mind right offhand is my good friend and colleague on the sports desk, Raul Duke. Most journalists only talk about objectivity, but Mr. Dr. Duke grabs it straight by the fucking throat. You will be hard-pressed to find any argument among professionals on the question of Dr. Duke's objectivity. As for mine, well... My doctor says it swole up and busted about ten years ago. The only thing I ever saw that come close to objective journalism was a closed-circuit TV setup that watched shoplifters in the general store at Woody Creek, Colorado. I'd always admired that machine, but I noticed that nobody paid much attention to it until one of those unknown, heavy out-front shoplifters came into the place. But when that happened, everybody got so excited that the thief had to something quick, like buy a green popsicle or a can of Coors and get out of the place immediately. So much for objective journalism. Don't bother to look for it here, not under any byline of mine or anyone I can think of, with the whole possible exception of things like box scores, race results, and stock market tabulations. There is no such thing as objective journalism. The phrase itself is a pompous contradiction in terms. And so much for all that, too. 
There was at least one more thing I wanted to get into here before trying to wind this down and get into something human, like sleep or that 550 watt humbox they have out there in the relax parlor at Silver Springs. Some people say they should outlaw the human box, but I disagree. Meanwhile, all that venomous speculation about what McCarthy is up to these days leaves a crucial question hanging. The odd truth that almost everybody in Washington who is paid to analyze and predict the behavior of vote blocks seems to feel that the much publicized youth vote will not be a major factor in the 72 presidential campaign would be a hell of a lot easier to accept if it weren't for the actual figures. What the experts appear to be saying is that the sudden addition of 25 million new votes between the ages of 18 and 25 will not make much difference in the power structures of American politics. No candidate will say this, of course. For the record, they are all very solicitous of the youth vote. In a close election, even 10% of that block would mean 2.5 million votes. A very serious figure when you stack it up against Nixon's thin margin over Humphrey in 68. Think of it. Only 10%. 2.5 million. Enough, even according to Nixon's own wizards, to swing almost any election. Then... There is a general assumption, based on the outcome of recent presidential elections, that it takes something genuinely vile and terrifying to cause either one of the major party candidates to come away with less than 40% of the vote. Goldwater managed to do this in 64, but not by much. Even after allowing Johnson's TV appearance, TV sappers to cast him as a stupid, bloodthirsty ghoul who had every intention of blowing the whole world off its axis the moment he got his hands on the button, Goldwater still got 227,176,799 votes, or 38%. The prevailing wisdom today is that any candidate in the standard brand two-party election will get about 40% of the vote. The root assumption here is that neither party would nominate a man more than 20% different than the type of person most Americans considered basically right and acceptable, which almost always happens. There is no potentially serious candidate in either major party this year who couldn't pass for the executive president of a mortgage loans in any hometown from Bangor to San Diego. We are talking about a purely physical image gig here, but even if you let the candidates jabber like magpies about anything that comes to their minds, not even a dangerous dingbat like Sam Yorty would be likely to alienate more than 45% or 50% of the electorate. And even that far-left radical bastard, George McGovern, babbling and maddling a maddening litany of his far-out ideas, would be hard-pressed to crank up any more than 30% animosity quotient. On balance, they are a pretty bland lot, even Spiro Agnew, if you catch him between screeds, is not more than 20% different from Humphrey or Lindsay or Scoop Jackson. Four years ago, in fact, John Lindsay dug Agnew so much that he seconded his nomination for the vice presidency. There are a lot of people who say we should forget about that this year, because John had already said he made a mistake about Agnew. But there are a lot of others who take Lindsay's Agnew mistake seriously, because they assume he would do the same thing again next week or next month if he thought it would do him any good. Nobody seems very worried about Lindsay right now. They are waiting to see what happens, what kind of action he can generate in Florida, a state full of transient and tr old transplanted New Yorkers. If he can't make it there, he's done for, which is just as well. But if he scores big in Florida, we'll probably have to start taking him seriously, particularly if Muskie looks convincing in New Hampshire. A Muskie Lindsay ticket could be one of those naturals, a marriage made in heaven and consumed by Larry O'Brien, which gets us back to one of the main reasons the political bastard wizards aren't counting a much of the youth vote this year. It is hard to imagine even a zealot like Allard Lowenstein going out on the trail 
once again to whip up a campus-based firestorm for Muskie and Lindsay, particularly with Eugene McCarthy lurking around with that ugly mouth of his and all those deep bleeding grudges. Another nightmare we might have to might as well start coming to grips with is the probability that Hubert Humphrey will be a candidate for the Democratic nomination this year, and there is probably some interesting talk going down about what Humphrey quarters about around Humphrey quarters these days. Say, uh, Hugh, baby, I guess you heard what your old buddy Gene did to Muskie the other day, right? Yeah, and we always thought they were friends, didn't we? Long pause, no reply from the candidate. So, uh, Hugh, you still met... You still with me? Jesus Christ, where's that sun lamp? We gotta get more of the tan on you. You look gray. Long pause, no reply from the candidate. Well, Hugh, we might just as well face this thing. We're coming up fast on what just might be a real nasty little problem for you. Let's try not to kid ourselves, Hube. He's a really mean son of a bitch. Long pause, etc. You're going to have to be ready, Hube. You announce next Tuesday, next Thursday at noon, right? So we might as well figure that crazy fucker is going to come down on you like a million pound shit hammer that same afternoon. He'll probably stage a big scene at the press club. And we know who's going to be there, don't we, Hube? Yeah, every bastard in their business. And are you ready for that, Hube? Baby, can you handle it? Long pause, no reply, heavy breathing. Okay, Hube, tell me this. What does the bastard know? What's the worst thing he can spring on you? What indeed? Was McCarthy just honing up his act on Ed Muskie? Or does he really believe that Muskie, rather than Humphrey, was the main agent of Johnson policy in the 68 convention? Is that possible? Was Muskie the man behind the, tran the treachery and bloodletting? Is McCarthy prepared to blow the whole lid off? Whose head does he really want? How far will he go to get it? Does this man have a price? This may be the only interesting question of the campaign until the big whistle blows in New Hampshire on March 7th. With McCarthy skulking around, Muskie can't afford anything but a thumping win over McGovern in that primary, but Mad Sam is up there too, and even Muskie's local handlers concede Yorty at the least 15% of the Democratic vote due to his freakish alliance to the neo-Nazi publisher of New Hampshire's only big paper, the Manchester Union Leader. The mayor of Los Angeles has never bothered to explain the twisted reasoning behind his candidacy in New Hampshire, but every vote he gets there will, be, will come off Muskie's pile, not McGovern's, which means that McGovern, already sitting at 20 to 25 percent of the vote, could zap Muskie's whole trip by picking up another 10 to 15 percent in a last-minute rush. Muskie took a head count in September and found himself leading by about 40 percent, but he will need at least 50 percent to look good on the fence sitters in Florida, who will go to the polls a week later, and in Florida, Muskie will have to beat back the showbiz charisma of John Lindsay in the left, more or less, and also deal with Scoop Jackson, Hubert Humphrey, and George Wallace on the right. Jesus, the gibberish could go on forever and ever now that I see myself falling into the old trap of that plagues every writer who gets sucked into this nutty, rotten business. You find yourself getting fascinated by the drifts and strange quirks of the game. Even now, before I finish this article, I can already feel the compulsions to start handicapping politics and Pittsburgh by six points in the early in, in primaries like it was just another fat Sunday pro football. Pick Pittsburgh by six points in the early game and Dallas, even with San Francisco later on, Win one, lose one. Then flip the dial and try to get ahead by coming, conning somebody into taking Green Bay, even against the Redskins. After several weeks of this, you no longer give a flying fuck who actually wins. The only thing that matters is the point spread. You find yourself scratching crazily at the screen, pleading for somebody to rip the lungs out of that junky bastard 
who just threw an interception and then didn't get then didn't even pretend to tackle the pig who ran it back for six points to beat the spread. There is something perverse and perverted about dealing with life on this level. But the other hand, it gets harder to convince yourself, once you start thinking about it, that it could be possible to even make any difference to you if the 49ers win or lose. Although every once in a while you stumble into a situation where you find yourself really wanting some team to get stomped over the field, severely beaten and humiliated. This happened to me on the last Sunday of the regular NFL season when two slobbering drunk sports writers at the Alexandria Gazette got me thrown out of the press box at Robert F. Kennedy Stadium in Washington. I was there as a special guest of Dave Bergen, sports editor of the Washington Star. But when Bergen tried to force a bit of dignity on the scene, they ejected him, too. We were halfway down the ramp the parking lot before I understood what had happened. That gin-soaked Nazi from the Gazette got pissed off when you didn't doff your hat at the National Anthem, Bergen explained. He kept bitching about you to the guy in charge of the press box, and then he got that asshole who works for him all cranked up, and they started talking and having you arrested. Jesus fucking shit, I muttered. Now I know why I got out of sports writing. Christ, I had no idea what was happening. You should have warned me. I was afraid you'd run amok, he said. We'd been in bad trouble. All those guys from things like Norfolk Ledger and the Army Navy Times. They would have stomped us like rats in a closet. I couldn't understand it. Hell, I'd have taken the goddamn hat off if I'd thought I was causing trouble. I barely even remembered the national anthem. Usually, I don't even stand up. I didn't think you were going to, he said. I didn't want to say anything, but I knew we were doomed. But I did stand, I said. I figured, hell, I'm Dave's guest. Why not stand and make it easy for him? But I never even thought about my goddamn hat. Actually, I was happy to get out of that place. The Redskins were losing, which pleased me, and we were thrown out just in time to get back to Bergen's house for the 49er game on TV. If they won this one, they would go against the Redskins next Sunday in the playoffs, and by the end of the third quarter, I had worked myself into a genuine hate frenzy, I was howling like a butcher when the 49ers pulled it out in the fifth in the final moments with a series of desperate maneuvers and the moment the game the gun sounded I was on the phone to TWA securing the seat on the Christmas 9 special to San Francisco it was extremely important I felt to go out there and do everything possible to make some of the red make sure the redskins got the mortal piss beaten out of them which worked out. Not only did the 49ers stomp the jingle bastards and knock them out of the playoffs, but my seat companion on the flight from Washington to San Francisco was Edward Bennett Williams, the legendary trial lawyer who was also president of the Washington Redskins. Heavy duty for you people tomorrow, I warned him. Get braced for a serious beating. Nothing personal, you understand. Those poor bastards couldn't have known that they were doing when they croaked a doctor of journalism out of the press box. He nodded heavily and called for another scotch and soda. It's a goddamn shame, he muttered. But what can you really expect? You lie down with pigs and they'll call you a swine every time. What? Did you call me a swine? Not me, he said. But this whole world is full of slander. We spent the rest of the flight arguing politics. He's backing Muskie. As he talked, I got the feeling that he thought he was already at a point where, sooner or later, we would all be. Ed's a good man, he said. He's honest. I respect the guy. Then he stabbed the padded seat arm between the two of us two or three times with his forefinger. But the main reason I'm working for him he said, is that he's the only guy we have who can beat Nixon. He stabbed the arm again. If Nixon wins again, we're in real trouble. He picked up his drink, then saw it was empty and put it down again. That's the real issue this time, he said. 
beating Nixon. It's hard to even guess how much damage those bastards will do if they get in for another four years. I nodded. The argument was familiar. I had even made it to myself here and there, but I was beginning to sense something very depressing about it. How many more of these goddamn elections are we going to have to write off as lame, but regrettably necessary, holding actions? And how many more of these stinking double-downer sideshows will we have to go through before we can get ourselves straight enough to put together some kind of national election that will give me and at least at least the 20 million people I tend to agree with, a chance to vote for something, instead of always being faced with that old familiar choice between the lesser of two evils. I have been through three presidential elections now, but it has been 12 years since I could look at a ballot and see a name I wanted to see and vote for. In 1964, I refused to vote at all, and in 68, I spent half the morning in the country courthouse getting an absentee ballot so I could vote, out of spite, for Dick Gregory. Now, with another one of those big, bogus showdowns looming down on us, I can already pick up the stench of another bummer. I understand, along with a lot of other people, that the big thing this year is beating Nixon. But that was also the big thing, as I recall, 12 years ago in 1960, and as far as I can tell, we've gone from bad to worse to rotten since then, and the outlook is for more of the same. And, as it turned out, another rabid Redskins fan the year was R Richard Nixon, despite his political differences with the management. His unsolicited advice to coach George Allen resulted in a disastrous interception, ending the Redskins' last hope for a come-from-behind victory in 1971 playoffs. They lost. The final score was 24-20. to Two weeks later, Nixon announced he was, he was backing Miami against Dallas in the Super Bowl. This time, he went so far as to send in a play which once again backfired disastrously. Miami lost 24-3. to The Nixon jinx continued to plague the, bad the Redskins again in the 73 Super Bowl. Despite quarterback Bill Kilmer's widely quoted statement, at that time he would just as soon do without any of the president's tactical advice. The Redskins were three-point favorites against the Dolphins this time around, but with Nixon on their side, they got blown out of the stadium and wound up on the sick end of a deceptively one-sided 14-7 defeat. Not even James Reston, the swinging Calvinist, claims to see any light at the end of the tunnel in 72. Reston's first big shot of the year dealt mainly with a grim memo by former JFK strategist Fred Dutton, who is now a Washington reporter. There are hints of hope in the Reston-Dutton prognosis, but for now, the next four years, here's the rancid nut of it. The 72 election is probably fated to be a dated weakening election, a historical curio belonging more to the past than to the new national three or four party trend of the future. Reston either ignored or overlooked for some reason the probability that Gene McCarthy appears to be gearing up almost exactly the same kind of independent third force in American politics that both Reston and Dutton see as a way for the future. An even grimmer note comes with Reston's offhand dismissal of Ed Muskie, the only man, according to E.B. Williams, who can possibly save us from four more years of Nixon. And if, uh, and as if a poor Muskie hadn't already had enough evil shit on his neck, the eminently reasonable, fine old liberal journal, the Washington Post, called Muskie's official new beginning. I am now a candidate, speech on national TV, a meaningless rehash of old bullshit and stale cliches raked up from old speeches by, yes, himself, Richard Milhouse Nixon. In other words, the weight of the evidence filtering down from the high brain rooms on both sides of New York Times and Washington Post seems to say we're all fucked. Muskie is a bonehead who's steals his best lines from old Nixon speeches, 
McGovern is doomed because everyone who knows him has so much respect for the man that they can't bring themselves to degrade the poor bastard by making him the president. John Lindsay is a dunce. Jean McCarthy is crazy. Humphrey is doomed and useless. Jackson should have stayed in bed. And, well, that just about wraps up the trip, right? Not entirely, but I feel the fear coming on. And the only cure for that is to chew up a fat block of wad, fat black wad of blood opium, about the size of a young meatloaf, meatball, and then call that call a cab for a fast run down that strip of X Film houses on 14th Street. Peel back the brain, let the opium take hold, and get locked into serious pornography. As for politics, I think Art Boot. Art Buchwald said it well last month in his fan letter to Nixon. I always wanted to get into politics, but I was never light enough to make the team. 